Oh, you guys are going to go build?
Good morning. Good morning. Glad to see you all this morning as we have gathered, as we always do, to worship our great God together. Uh, let me just start by stating the obvious. Pastor Chris isn't here this morning, so you're probably seeing the bulletin that he's supposed to be preaching. Uh, so Pastor Chris, he, um, he felt, started feeling under the weather, and uh, then he wound up testing himself, so he did test positive for COVID. So out of being wise and following health guidelines, um, him and Sarah and the children stayed home uh, this week. So, <clears throat> which is why I'm up here, by the way. Um, so just keep Pastor Chris and Sarah in prayer. Um, obviously, I talked to Chris, so I don't want to make it seem like he's like terribly sick. He does have some symptoms, but he's okay. Uh, but obviously, testing positive, he wanted to be wise and not come in and spread his love with everybody in the church. Um, so just pray for them. Obviously, if you have small kids, it's really hard to isolate yourself from kids, and kids love to spread germs around the house. So just keep them in prayer. God willing, they'll obviously be back uh, next Sunday. With that in mind, you probably also notice every so often you see some people who don't show up to church. Um, it's not because they want to miss church, but um, obviously the elders, we, we know about it, that people get sick and people are uh, not feeling well. So as you see people not here, keep them in prayer. If you think about them, give them a call. Just find out how they're doing. Uh, but people are, unfortunately, this is the season where people are feeling under the weather. So as you see people not here, give them a call, pray for them, and uh, check up on them. Last little bit before we... Uh, begin with the call to worship. Um, I won't be preaching Chris's sermon either, so I guess technically I could read his manuscript, but I'd feel like it'd be weird for me to talk about competitive swimming. Um, <laughs> so I decided not to. I'm not going to be. So Chris will pick up where he would be this week uh, with John 18, and so he'll be preaching that. So what we'll do this morning is our prayer of intercession is uh, Psalm 134. So Elder Morris is still going to be praying. We're not going to skip prayer, but actually what we'll do for the sermon is work our way through Psalm 134. I think it'll be helpful, but I'm biased. Um, but I think it'll be helpful for how we understand and what we are called to do uh, in worship. Uh, last bit is, it'll be obvious to you, but I'll s say it anyway. It's probably going to be slightly shorter of a sermon. Um, so some, some of y'all will be very happy that it's shorter, <laughs> but uh, that's, that's perfectly fine. So either way, we will still worship the Lord as we always do. Uh, but as I said, keep everyone that you don't see, uh, including the Diebolds, Keep them in prayer that their health would come back so we can all worship our great God together. Well, let's now stand for our call to worship. And our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 99. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king in his might loves justice. be with you and also with you let us worship god
us pray. Our great God, we come this morning as your chosen and redeemed people, come and singing our hallelujahs to you. We praise you for you in your resurrection have conquered death and sin itself. And Lord, we come each Sunday morning gathered to praise your holy, just, and righteous name. And now, Lord, we ask that you would be with us, that you would receive our praise, that you would hear our prayers, and give to us yourself. Be with us, we ask, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. This morning, as we affirm our faith, we'll be looking at and using uh, Luther's small catechism. So, Christian, this morning I ask you, what do we believe? I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost creature, secured and delivered me even from my sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with silver and gold, but with his holy precious blood, and with his innocent sufferings and death, in order that I might be his own, live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, even as he is risen from the dead and lives and reigns forever. This is most certainly true. Amen. You may be seated. We now have an opportunity, knowing that our Lord hears us, to confess our sins to him together as a church. So church, let us now pray together our prayer of confession. Most holy and merciful Father, we acknowledge and confess before you our sinful nature, prone to evil and slothful and good, and all our shortcomings and offenses. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. O Lord, have mercy upon us, who are ashamed and sorry for everything in which we have displeased you. Teach us to hate our errors, cleanse us from our secret faults, and forgive our sins for the sake of your dear Son. And O oh, most holy and loving Father, help us to live in your life and walk in your ways according to the commandments of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear this word of assurance. Uh, from the Lord, as written by the Apostle Joel. He writes, Yet even now declares the Lord, Return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. And rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Hear that promise, church, that as we confess our sins, God is just and he forgives us through the shed blood of his son, Jesus Christ. We are forgiven, and we are his forever. Amen. Amen. Let us now stand, sing our hymn of praise, hymn 44, How Great Thou Art.
may be seated. Today the scripture reading is found in our Blue Bible on page 505, uh, 599. Uh, for those who don't know, they are right under your seats. Uh, we're going to read Isaiah chapter 39, verses 1 through 8. Um, Merodach Baladan was an accomplished Babylonian leader who was twice able to make himself the king of Babylon and defiance of the Assyrians. It is easy to understand why Hezekiah would be glad to receive the envoys. After all, he is a great world leader, paying attention to little Judah. There is something immensely flattering when someone who we consider more important than we pays attention to us. But there is also something dangerous as well. Um, Namely, that we succumb to the temptation to convince the important person that the attention being, pay, uh, being given is justified. Sadly, that is the temptation that Hezekiah falls. Here is a wonderful opportunity <coughs> to declare the glory of God to the nations. The illness may, be, may have been only a pretest for Merodach Baladan to do some political fence building but still is the ostensible basis for the visit. So Hezekiah could have used the visit to tell the story of what the sole God of the universe did for him. But instead of giving God its deserved glory, Hezekiah, like Moses long before, takes the opportunity to make himself look good. The detailed list of what uh, he shows the Babylonians, a summary statement, they have seen all. There is nothing I did not show them. Is Isaiah's way of emphasizing how completely Hezekiah falls into a trap. Isaiah announces that what the men have seen will one day belong to the Babylonians. Not just his possessions will be carried off, but his family too. Nothing Hezekiah has will be left. By showing that Hezekiah is both mortal and fallible. Isaiah does two things. First, he shows that trust is intended to be a way of life, not a one-time experience. And second, Isaiah is, Isaiah is showing here, showing that there is no final salvation in a human being, no matter how good he might be. Our hope is not, is not, on, not in the perfectibility of humanity, the Messiah is much better than that. Isaiah chapter 39, verses 1 through 8. <coughs> At the time, Merodach Baladan and the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent envoys with letters to, and a present to Hezekiah, for he heard that he had been sick and had recovered. And Hezekiah welcomed them gladly. And he showed them his treasure house, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious oil, his whole armory, all that was found in the storehouses. There was nothing in his house or in all his realm that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said to him, What did this man say? And from where did they come, out, come to you? Hezekiah said, They have come from a far country. From Babylon. He said, What have they seen in your house? Hezekiah answered, They have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing in my storehouses that I did not show them. Then, Hezekiah, then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up till this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And some of your own sons who will come from you, whom you will father, shall be taken away. And they shall be eunuchs 
in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord that you have spoken is good. For he thought, there will be peace and security in my days. The word of the Lord. If I can now have the ushers come up, let us now worship the Lord through our tithes and offerings. great God, we do thank you for these gifts and for the ability to even give them. Uh, we know the strength to work and provide for ourselves and our families comes from you. And so, Lord, we ask now that you would bless these gifts, no matter how great or small this sacrifice has been. Use these gifts for the glory of your great name and for the spreading of your gospel. Bless me, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 You may be seated. For our intercessory prayer this morning, I will not be praying through Psalm 134 because Jared, as he said, will be preaching through it. <laughs> so instead, I will start with a brief introduction from Psalm 113, and then we'll have our intercessory prayer. Let us pray. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Lord, we do praise your name. We acknowledge that you are the one true God, creator of the world and everything in it. You cause the rains to fall and the crops to grow. You alone are worthy of our praise and worship. We confess that we do not always live as though we honor your name and your sovereignty. We continually do things which you have commanded us not to do, and we don't do the things that we should. Forgive us for our disobedience, and give us new hearts which desire to please you. We thank you for the rain and the life and growth it brings. We thank you for the farmers and the crops they produce, that we can get nourishment from the land. We thank you for the flowers and the trees and the beauty they give to the world. We thank you that you made man and gave him dominion over all the earth. 
Help us to be good stewards of your creation and to enjoy it and care for it for the generations to come after us. We thank you for this place of worship and for Pastor Chris, whom you've raised up to lead us in worship. Help him as he re continues his recovery from COVID. Give him the strength he needs to return to his normal schedule. We thank you for how you've worked in Jared Smith's life to enable him to be licensed to preach. And we thank you that he is willing and able on short notice to preach in Pastor Chris's absence. Lord, we ask that you would be with all the members of our congregation who are currently sick or recovering from COVID or other ailments. Keep them safe from the severe symptoms and side effects and enable them to resume their normal work quickly. We thank you for the continued work of David Anderson and the events he is planning this year to reach people in the media. We thank you that people are being drawn to his ministry in greater numbers and the events are being effective at reaching people and bringing them the good news of your gospel. Be with all our church members through the coming week. Guide them safely to school, work, or wherever they may go. Give them chances to share the good news about the salvation that you offer through your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our, as we stated before, our scripture lesson for this morning will be Psalm 134. And so you can turn there. Uh, it's a fairly short, short psalm, only three verses. Uh, but we'll read it and uh, work our way through. I'll give you a moment. Psalm 134. Psalm 134, a song of ascents. Come, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. The word of the Lord, let us pray together. Our great God, we do thank you this morning for your word. And we thank you that we have an opportunity to come to praise and worship you together as your people. And now, Lord, we ask that uh, by your spirit you would come be with us to empower the preaching of the word, but also the hearing. May we all have our ears opened and our hearts opened to hear what you would have to say to us uh, through this psalm and through these verses. Bless our time together, Lord, and may it be honoring to you. Be with us, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Psalm 134, as the uh, state in the beginning, is a song of ascents. Now, as we've been praying through the psalm of ascents, I think Pastor Chris had mentioned it when we first started praying through the psalm of ascents, what they are. But just to reiterate, the psalm of ascents are essentially a collection of uh, 15 psalms or songs. Uh, and these were songs that would have been uh, sung, generally speaking, sung as pilgrim songs as God's people, the Israelites, would have made their way from wherever they were scattered at the time, made their way back to Jerusalem and back to Mount Zion to the temple to worship the Lord at various uh, feasts. There were three main feasts or festivals and worship times, uh, but they would come back. And these would be, these 15 songs would be the songs that they would sing as they made their pilgrimage about to, back to Mount Zion. Now, what it does for us, because we don't, we don't have special feast days, but we do have a feast day or a worship day every week. And so what the Song of Ascents do, uh, even though there's some distance between the people of Israel and us and how we worship, they do guide us in how we are called to prepare ourselves in worship, what we are called to do in the presence of God in our worship. So I think that it's actually very helpful for us to look at Psalm 134, uh, actually the ending of the Song of Ascents. So this is the last one. But I think it does help to guide us what we uh, are doing and what we are called to do uh, in worship. Now, Psalm 134, if, as you as I read, it's short, but as you probably heard, there is a what I'll consider a dual blessing that is taking place in the psalm. On one hand, there is the blessing that takes place from God's people to God, and then there's the blessing from God to His people in worship. Now, 
just to pull together what is a blessing, and I kind of pulled together from uh, various theologians, people like Bruce Waltke and others, what is a blessing? Blessing, as I would put it, is the bestowing of an overflow of benefits for the sake of goodness, happiness, and flourishing. Now, with that definition of what a blessing is, generally speaking, we don't struggle with blessings flowing from the greater excuse me, to the lesser. To hear that God blesses us as people doesn't really bother us. It's a good thing for us because we're the ones receiving the blessing, but it also makes sense. The greater is always blessing the lesser. God blesses all throughout Scripture. God blesses the, sa the Sabbath day in creation. God blesses various creatures in creation, you know, telling them to be fruitful and multiply. God blesses the marriage, telling them to be fruitful and multiply. Right? God blesses Abraham, saying that I'll make your descendants like the stars of the heaven and the sand of the seashore. There's a blessing. God blesses all these folks. God blesses his, the people of Israel with restoration, salvation, conquering land and giving them the promised land. These all make sense to us. But how do we really bless God? At least I struggle with the, the, the idea. Because blessings always go from the greater to the lesser, but how does a blessing go from the lesser to the greater? The way I kind of think about it when we think about blessing, it's almost like if I were to give Elon Musk a gift card. <laughs> right? It, it makes no sense. There's nothing I can give him that he really needs. In an even greater way, there's nothing we can actually give God and bless him with. But there's also the turn of phrase of what it means to bless is the idea of praising God. So we don't give God something that he actually needs, but it's ascribing to him who he already is. So we praise God and ascribe to him his character as he already is, and we praise him for his goodness and the great and many works that he does on our behalf. So we have this dual blessing in Psalm 134. We have the blessing, which actually takes the last thing we'll talk about in verse 3, is God's blessing the greater to the lesser. He blesses us in worship, uh, but there also is a blessing that we give to God, which is ascribing his glory and his character and giving praise to him for his goodness. But in the psalm, uh, as we look to it, what does it actually look like for us to bless God. We talk about praising just in general, but I think there's more that actually can be said from the psalm on what it looks like for us, even as we prepare ourselves as God's people to worship Sunday after Sunday, what does it look like for us to bless God? First thing I think it looks like as we look at verse 1, the first thing that the psalmist says is, come, or if you have another version, or it can be translated different ways, behold, or look. The idea that the psalmist, and this happens multiple times in all the psalms, but it also happens multiple times in the Song of Ascents, these songs, these songs of uh, pilgrimage and worship. And whenever you see that, come or behold, it's the idea that whoever is reading this psalm or singing the song is called to be very attentive to what they are doing. And so how do we bless God? We bless God in worship by being attentive to what we are doing. Part of this idea of being attentive, I think, also comes from who the psalmist is speaking of in these short few verses. The psalmist talks about these night watchers, or people who watch in the night. Right? Come bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. And so the question is kind of, is who, are, who are these night watchers? Right? Who, are, who are these people that the psalmist is calling these watchers of the night? The reality, these are probably, or for the most part, these are Levites. Right? These are whether priests or other Levites who are not necessarily priests, but they are temple workers. And the idea, I think, that the psalmist is putting forth uh, to these uh, temple workers is they are called to be attentive in the work they are doing in the temple as temple worshipers. Now, the possibility being that this Psalm 134 is the final song of ascents or the final pilgrimage song, there is a possibility that this song is actually one that is sung as the uh, travelers are now leaving the temple or leaving Mount Zion, going back home. And so to a certain degree, we can say the temple workers, the, the enjoyment and the excitement of all the people being in the temple, worshiping God as a large crowd, that is starting to die off. And here we have these folks who don't work during the day, but they are watching at night. 
And the psalmist is telling them what you're doing. It, it seems like begrudging work. You remember, the temple is just always working. Right? There's always sacrifice being made. There's always things to be done in the temple. And after a while, those things seem very, very routine. And even more, these are folks who are watching at night, so it's not even daytime. And they're still doing the, at least, begrudging, monotonous work of worship at night. And so the psalmist, it's possible, though obviously with short, short time, I couldn't make a final decision on all these things. <laughs> but it is possible that it's actually the psalmist writing from the, from the position of the travelers saying back to the temple workers, I know what you're doing may seem like it's boring, but behold, watch be faithful and be attentive to what you're doing. Now that applies to us. Why? Because quite honestly, in our liturgy, we do the same thing every Sunday. We don't switch up our liturgy to, to make it funky. <laughs> and if we are not attentive as worshipers of God, we'll keep doing the same monotonous work and it will mean nothing to us. And so how do we bless God? We bless God by being attentive to the constant work of worship that we are called to do Sunday after Sunday. Uh, Calvin, in his commentary, Calvin takes a, I guess, well, I'm taking more of Calvin's view. I shouldn't say Calvin's <coughs> taking my view because, one, I'm not Calvin. He came way before me. But Calvin is taking a more negative view, which is what I'm taking by looking at these temple, worker, temple workers and the possibility that they are drawing tired from doing the same thing over and over again. So here what, here what Calvin says about these workers, and I think a lot of it applies uh, to us as worshipers as well. Calvin writes, he says, Many of the Levites, through the tendency which there is in all men to abuse ceremonies, considered that nothing more was necessary than standing idly in the temple and thus overlooked the principal part of their duty. The psalm would show that merely to keep nightly watch over the temple, kindle the lamps, and superintend the sacrifices was of no importance unless... They served God spiritually and referred all outward ceremonies to that which must be considered the main sacrifice, the celebration of God's praises. You may think it is very laborious service, as if he had said to stand at watch in the temple while others sleep in their own houses. But the worship which God requires is something more excellent than this and demands of, demands of you to sing his praises before all the people. Calvin's making a good point to us. Though he's talking about the temple workers, the point is they may be doing their work just over and over again in a tireless, tireless manner. But I think what Calvin is saying to us is be attentive. Come ready, prepared to praise God, even though we are doing the same thing over and over again Sunday after Sunday. Just to add a little more, I'm going to, uh, and I'll actually do it a couple of times throughout the sermon. Uh, let's look at the uh, BCO, which is the Book of Church Order, which is a big, boring book that a lot of you probably never read. But it's the Book of Church Order for the, for the PCA, our denomination. The last section of the Book of Church Order is called the, I think it's the last major section, it's called the Directory of Worship, which basically guides uh, us as a church how we are called to come to worship and what we're called to do in worship. And so as we looked at John Calvin, now let's look at uh, the BCO, the Directory of Worship, and one of the uh, paragraphs in the directory of worship, what it says. It, write, it reads this. It says, Public worship must be performed in spirit and in truth. Externalism and hypocrisy stand condemned. The forms of public worship have value only when they serve to express the inner reverence of the worshiper and his sincere devotion to the true and living God. And only those whose hearts have been renewed by the Holy Spirit are capable of such reverence and devotion. I think that's a, it's a sober reminder to us as God's worshipers from the, from the directory of worship. What are we are called to do? We're called to come prepared, to be attentive, and to be fully enveloped in the worship and praise of our God. Now, like I said before, we know we're doing the same thing. We switch the hymns around. It's the same liturgy. And yet we're still called to come, to be attentive, to worship our great God together. Now, as we talk about these night watchers or those who watch at night, on one hand, they're the Levitical workers who are called to constantly do the work of the temple, but there's also a second job 
uh, it may be a second group of people, or at the very least, it's the second job of the same folks that are doing uh, the work of the temple, and it combines with going with being attentive, is that their, their job also is to guard the temple. So they're called to constantly do the, the nightly work of the temple, temp, uh, sacrifices or whatso. But they're also called to guard the temple. Right? Now, they're, on one hand, they're literally just called to guard because obviously the temple is full of very expensive metals and precious jewels and things. So they're just called to guard it because they don't want anybody stealing it. But all, what I think is actually more important than just people stealing very important things out of the temple, it's to guard to make sure nothing unclean and unholy gets into the temple and desecrates the holiness and the cleanness of the temple. Now, this may be more for uh, the s folks who serve on the session here. That there is a huge responsibility for us. I mean, everybody should listen to this, but to guard in a certain degree the holiness of both the life and the doctrine and the worship in, their, in our church. And that's heavy and hard work to do, to guard what comes in and how we worship our God together. And I'll say, now this is your responsibility as the rest of the church, you should be holding us accountable if we're not doing that. If we are being lax in our job, not guarding the life and doctrine of the church and guarding the holy things or the worship of God in church, you should be calling us out. Now don't be rude. Take us <laughs> to the side. But that is our responsibility. The second job of these temple workers, not only were to continue to do the work, but it was also called to guard the holiness and the holy worship of God. And to a certain degree, that is a, a good portion of the work of those who serve on this session as elders, to guard the church and guard the holy worship uh, of our God. We're called to be shepherds. Shepherds, part of the shepherd's job was to fight off wolves. And it's interesting, whenever Paul and other places in the New Testament, when they talk about wolves, usually they're talking about people who come with false doctrine and false teaching. Those are the wolves. And so our job as a session is to guard, as the temple workers were also car called to guard. Now, how do we guard, though? This is for all of us, though. How do we guard the holy worship of our holy God? We don't do it with swords or anything like that, though there may be a card-carrying member somewhere here, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, gun card carry. They, that's what I meant by <laughs> carrying. Uh, but how do we guard the holy worship of our holy God? By the word of God. When our worship is guided and led, and I would also say saturated with God's word, we in turn are guarding the holy, wor holy worship of our God. And so that's why you're going to hear over and over again, we will sing God's word. We will read God's word. We will pray God's word. And we will preach God's God's word, and we'll do it all as faithfully as we possibly can. Yes, we're all sinners. But if our worship is to be good and right and holy and faithful to our Lord, the way we guard it is by making sure that all that we do in worship is led and saturated with the word of God. Final point I just want to make about saturating our worship and our liturgy with scripture is that make sure that we understand that a saturated, a biblically saturated liturgy is automatically evangelistic. We could be tempted, right? Or maybe I'm tempted. If we don't see a lot of unbelievers come in and we go, well, we got to do something cool and fun and hip to gather people in so that unbelievers would come and go, man, this church is like the coolest church I've ever been to. No. The, the biblically saturated liturgy and worship of the church is automatically evangelistic. And I think the Apostle Paul picks kind of this, uh, this idea up in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Now we know that in 1 Corinthians 14 when Paul is, is working through the order of worship in the church or what it means to have orderly worship in the church, he is distinguishing between uh, those who are speaking in tongues in church, he's saying, listen, don't, don't do that because you can confuse a lot of people. What we need are people who are going to be prophesying. Now, by prophesying, he's not talking about uh, your, tele your favorite televangelist 
acting like they're prophet. What he's talking about is don't speak in tongues in language that people that no one understands where they come in. But rather, if we have people that are faithful, faithfully proclaiming God's word throughout the liturgy, when people come in who are outsiders, I'm going to read the text in a second, who are outsiders, they will be constantly hearing the word of God. And that is evangelistic in itself. So Paul says, but if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an outsider enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed. And so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. As I said before, we are called to guard the holy worship of our God. In order to guard it, it has to be saturated with scripture. And I think what Paul is basically saying is, when that happens, we don't need to do anything fancy in worship. But the biblically saturated worship of God is automatically evangelistic. So going back, what are we called to do? To be attentive, to bless God, we are called to be attentive. We're called to be attentive in preparing ourselves for worship. We're called to be attentive to the liturgy in the sense of making sure that it's biblically saturated by guarding uh, the holy worship of our God. I'll make one last comment and then we'll move on. Now, the other thing that I think in this day and age that we need to guard is not only the worship itself, the liturgy, make sure it's biblically saturated. We need, we need to guard the actual day of worship in itself, which would be Sunday, today. And what I mean by that is we need to guard the fact that we are called to hold the Sabbath in high regard. Now, what is today? Somebody in the head has said, Super Bowl Sunday. Wrong, right? Today is Sunday in which the Super Bowl will be played. <laughs> now, now it's, it's a joke what I'm saying, and I'm kind of just using a, a phrase, turn of phrase, but I, there's actually a point of what I'm saying. If we went to bed last night and woke up this morning with the idea that today is Super Bowl Sunday, to a certain degree, we have not honored the Lord's Day in our heart. Now, I'm not going to bond anybody's conscience by watching the Super Bowl. To be quite honest, I'm probably going to catch a little bit of it, and I'm going to fall asleep like I do any other time. <laughs> but my point is, we guard the Lord's Day. How did we prepare for it? Right? If we came in today, and you're hoping that my sermon is short, so you can get home and throw wings in to be prepared for Super Bowl Sunday, you are not honoring the Lord's Day. Like I said, I'm not going to bind anybody's conscience about watching football. I, I struggle with it myself, so I'm not going to lie. But I'm also not going to bind anybody because I'm not fully convicted yet, and maybe I need to be. But either way, are we honoring this, at the very least, the spirit of the Sabbath if our whole day on Saturday preparing for Sunday and our thoughts about today is to watch a game? Today is the Lord's Day. We have to remember, and I was honestly, I, as I was thinking through this, I was reminded I think it was last year, uh, Mr. Jim Tyne taught, taught about the Sabbath day. And it's the idea that it, this is not begrudging. We are given the Sabbath day. That's one thing he was trying to press home, which I appreciate it. We are given the Lord. This is a good day for us. And we honor it and guard it to a certain degree by preparing ourselves in the right way, knowing what is important for this day. Now, if you don't like what I said, let me just read the shorter catechism. Question 60 says this, how is the Sabbath to be sanctified? Answer, the Sabbath is to be sanctified by a holy resting all that day, even from such worldly employments and recreations as are lawful on all other days, and spending the whole time in the public and private exercises of God's worship, except so much as to be taken up in the works of necessity and mercy. God calls us worship rightly. God calls us to be attentive. And lastly, God calls us, I think, to guard even what we're called to do now, guard the holy day, guard the Sabbath in our hearts as holy and setting apart for the worship of our God. So how do we bless the Lord? We bless the Lord by being attentive. We bless it by guarding uh, the right worship of our God. And then lastly, we bless the Lord. Verse, this is verse, that was all verse one. We bless the Lord, verse two, in humble adoration. Verse 2, the first phrase of verse 2, it says, lift up your hands. This is, uh, if you're an Israelite, this is a posture of humility for an Israelite as they come to worship, to have their hands lifted. Now, we're more modern. Yeah. 
Some denominations will lift their hands. We don't really lift our hands. We're Presbyterian. We don't do much of anything. <laughs> but how do we do it now? We bow our heads. We may close our eyes, uh, right? Or, or we may, in some places, we may kneel at certain times. Even if just at home, you kneel before you go to bed at night and pray. These are different postures. So we don't have to lift our hands. But the idea is that these Israelites, right, their lifting of the hands was a sign of humility to God. And we are called to do the same thing in some way. It may be important to use your body that helps your heart get in the right position of being humble before God in humble adoration. The, now, we used to do it back in the day. Well, not back in the day. I haven't been there that long. But when uh, Pastor Donnie, we would do the uh, Sursum Corda. I got to read it because I don't know the name. But I remember what we used to say before, uh, before the Lord's table was the idea of, of humbling ourselves, right? Pastor Donnie would say, we lift, you know, lift up your hearts. We would say, we lift them up to the Lord. The idea is that whatever bodily position you're in, hands lifted, kneeling, heads bowed, the point is not just that your body is in the right position, but that your heart is in the right position. And so the psalmist is, either whether he's talking to the travelers or talking back to the temple workers, the point is be in a position that would point your heart in the right direction to have humility before our great God. Using Calvin again, Calvin says... For why do men lift their hands when they pray? Is it not that their hearts may be raised at the same time to God? The Apostle Paul would also, I think he's picking up, he, a lot of times there's talks about lifting hands, but the Apostle Paul has picked up this language as well uh, in 1 Timothy when he writes this in chapter 2. He says, I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger and quarreling. The point is this. Whatever bodily position that you use, the point is that your heart is humbled and in the right place as we come to worship our great God together. First phrase, lift up your hands. The second phrase the psalmist says is, lift your hands up to the holy place. Now, it should be obvious that what the psalmist is not saying is, worship the temple. But the idea is that, well, What is the temple or what is Mount Zion? It's the throne of the king of all the earth. And so really, when he's saying lift your hands to the holy place, what he's actually saying is lift your hands and lift your hearts in humility to God, the king of all creation, who sits on his throne, who in verse 3 will then be blessing those of us who are humble and come to him and worship and praise. So what are we called to do? Be humble. And be humbled toward our holy God, who is the king of all creation. And then he says, and bless the Lord. Which is what we do when we come together, praising our God, whether through song, through the affirmation of our faith in various ways, the confession of sins. These are all the ways that we come praising and blessing the Lord, both, as we said before, for his character and for his goodness and those things he does for us. Going back to the directory of worship, another chapter says this, and I think it's helpful as we prepare ourselves. It says, it behooves God's people not only to come into his presence with a deep sense of awe at the thought of his perfect holiness and their own exceeding sinfulness, but also to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise for the great salvation which he has so graciously wrought for them through his only begotten son, and apply to them by the Holy Spirit. We come prepared, and we come prepared to do the work of worship, which is to be humble, to praise our great God, blessing his name, in praise and in adoration. As you think about liturgically, how do we do that? As I kind of finish out this part before we get to what God does for us and blessing us. So what does it mean, or what does it look like in our liturgy? Right? How do we bless God? Together we sing praises to him. We bless him. We, in humility, confess our sins to him. In humility. We offer up our prayers knowing that he hears us. Raising holy hands, bowing our heads, and whatever bodily posture we use, we, by blessing God, give our prayers to him. And, I would say lastly, We sit under his word. We humble ourselves. 
We don't come, right, to do our own thing. We don't come to, especially if you're, if you're the one preaching that morning, you don't come giving your own opinion. But we all sit under God's word in humility, prepared as God's people to honor him and bless him through our humility and through our praise of our great God. So we bless the Lord. We bless the Lord through our attentiveness. We bless the Lord through our humble adoration. But that's not the end of the psalm. There is also the great news that God blesses us when we come and worship. And even as we look at Psalm 134 and how the Lord blesses uh, the people. Now, there are two options, and I'll just give them to you. As we look at verse 3, what is actually happening in verse 3? So option one is that in verse 3, the psalmist is writing as a pilgrim, right? He's writing on behalf, or how shall I say, on behalf of the pilgrims who's basically looking back at the temple, the temple workers, and they're bestowing God's blessing on the priests and the Levites and the temple workers in their continual work. That's one possible option. Or the second option is that it's going the other way, that verse 3 are the priests giving their benediction towards the travelers, blessing them as they head home. Now, pick whatever option you want, as I said, with lack of timing. You just throw both options out and you have the option to pick which one. But to me, it doesn't really matter because either way, whether it's the priest blessing the people as they leave or the people as they leave blessing the priest for the work that they do, either way, each person is calling down God's blessings to a group of people. So either way, it's God blessing the people. And so what that means for us is as we come to worship, we come blessing the Lord, but we also come expecting a blessing from God in our time to worship. And that's okay to do. It's perfectly fine and it's right and good and just for us as God's people to come to bless him, but to also expect and know that we are receiving a great blessing from our God. The writer then, the psalmist says that may God bless you, and I'll say these two things. One, he says, may God bless you from Zion. As he said before, what is Zion or what is the Temple Mount? It's the throne of God, in a sense, a representative of the throne of God on earth. So to a certain degree, what the psalmist is saying, it's not talking about the, the temple itself, like may the temple bless you, but may God, who sits enthroned, right, to a certain degree, on, in the temple, may he bless you as the king does. So what does it mean? If God is the king, that one, that means he's the one who conquers but the one who's also able to actually bless all those who come to him in humble worship. As the ending of the verse would say, and we know this, why? Because the one who sits enthroned, right, the God who sits enthroned on Mount Zion, is the one who created heaven and earth. So he's capable, he's able, and he is willing to bless his people who come in humble worship to him, for he's the king, and he won. He created all that there is to bless you, and two, he owns it all. So there's nothing that is outside of his reach to give to his people to bless them as they come in humble worship to him. Now, just in case you think that that means only physical things, right? Well, God's going to, what kind of church I came from, sorry. Well, God's going to bless you with some new car or something like that. It's not, no. Right? Even so in the New Testament, it talks about what? That God has all we need for what? Not for a new car, but for life and godliness. We come in humble adoration, and we know that what we're going to receive from God Sunday after Sunday is his great blessing, the work of the Spirit in our life, right? For what? That we may live a godly life, for life and godliness to honor him in all that we do. God is able, he's willing, and he has all that he needs to bless his people as we come in humble worship to him. Just to close it out, so what does it look like, right? We talked about what it means in our liturgy for us to bless God. And so when we come, we should probably think, okay, when we're going to worship, this is what it looks like. We're blessing God in these various ways as God's people, singing praises to him, hearing his word, so forth and so on. But in the reverse, and probably even a greater way, when we look through the liturgy, when we come and worship together, 
you read it in a way where we say this is God blessing us in our worship. All right, so think of it this way. God, one, calls us. All right, so when we read the call to worship, it's not just a scripture that's been picked and thrown out to start the service. No, this is God calling us to worship. God receives our praises. God pardons our sins. God receives our praise and our prayers. God is the one who gives us his word. In the Lord's table, it is God who feeds us himself. And with the benediction, it is God who sends us out with his presence and his blessing. If you read it that way, one, the worship service is a lot more, ex more exciting. But it also helps us to come to be a lot more expectant to what's going to be taking place within the hour and 15 minutes or so when we are here gathered every Sunday morning. We come to bless God. But even more, God is here to bless us as his people in his various ways. Let me, uh, let me finish with uh, the, once again, the directive of worship. I think these two paragraphs, and my apologies for the length, but I think they're good, and honestly, they're probably better than anything I would say to close out the sermon anyhow. But here with the directory of worship, once again from the BCL, hear what it says as it talks about as we close out what it means for us to worship God and what God gives to us. Uh, two, two, uh, two of the paragraphs. A service of public worship is not merely a gathering of God's children with each other. But before all else, a meeting of the triune God with his chosen people. God is present in public worship, not only by virtue of the divine om omnipresence, but much more intimately as the faithful covenant savior. For the Lord Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And secondly, the end of public worship is the glory of God. His people should engage in all its several parts with an eye single to his glory. Public worship has as its aim the building of Christ's church by the perfecting of the saints and the addition to its membership of such as are being saved all to the glory of God. Through public worship on the Lord's Day, Christians should learn to serve God all the days of the week in their every activity, remembering whether they eat or drink or whatever they do, to do all to the glory of God. And with that, I would just say amen. Pray that this would be helpful for you as we gather each Sunday, worshiping our great God. And now let's pray to him. Our Lord, we do thank you once again for your word, and we thank you uh, for this psalm that helps to guide and lead us as we come and worship. Lord, even as we know we are called to bless you, we are feeble and frail, and so we ask that each Sunday you would empower us by your spirit to praise you rightly. And then help us, Lord, in our hearts to be prepared and humble, to receive all that you would give to us, that you would bless us with your spirit, and that we would be, we would remember the greatest gift and the greatest blessings you've given us, which is Jesus Christ, your son, for our forgiveness and our salvation. Be with us now even as we feed the Lord's table at your table, and as we leave with your blessing. We praise you in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us stand together and sing our hymn of response, hymn 411, Shine thy upon, thine, Thou Upon Us, Lord. <coughs>
ye who do truly and earnestly repent of your sins, trusting in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, who paid the price for our sins, all ye who are in love and charity with your neighbors and intend to lead a new life, following the commandments of God, walking from henceforth in his holy ways, draw near with faith to take this holy sacrament to your comfort. And now to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his very own blood and has made us to be kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and forever. Amen. My dear friends in the Lord, hear the gracious words that our Savior Jesus Christ saith unto all who will tr truly turn to him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I am weak, meek, and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest to your souls. I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. He that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. How blessed are they who do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Let us now hear the words of the institution of the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ as they are delivered to us by the Apostle Paul. I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and giving thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do, this do as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye drink this bread and drink this cup, ye show forth the Lord's death until he come. Before we partake, shall we bow in prayer. Our Lord and our Heavenly Father, how we thank you that of your great mercy you gave your Son your only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus, to take our nature upon himself, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, to make a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice for our sins. And now, O oh Lord, we most humbly ask that you would bless and sanctify with your Holy Spirit both us here and these thy gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break may indeed be the communion of the body of Christ, and the cup of blessing which we bless, the communion of the Lord of the blood of Jesus Christ. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake.
Jesus said, I am the bread of life come down from heaven. I have the living bread come down from heaven. If anyone will eat of me, he shall live forever. And he took the bread, and having given thanks, he broke it, and he said, Take eat. This is my body, broken for you. we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. set us at this table through spiritual food, assuring us of your goodness toward us, assuring us that we are members of the mystical body of your Son, the blessed company of all the faithful people who have gone before us, heirs of heaven, everlasting How we thank you today.
And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and in the love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. seated please thank you dr anderson let me just make a uh, few quick announcements and, uh, and then you'll be dismissed after that uh first announcement is actually not on the back um but uh we'll be pulling together a choir for easter sunday so if you're interested or even just have questions about that um and i think the practice is going to start next week you can either see betsy you see Bethy, Betsy or Amelia. So if you have any, if you definitely want to do it, or if you just have questions, see either one of them. Um, the women's and men's uh, study groups are still going on. I don't have to make a full announcement about that. Everyone, if you're part of it, you kind of know what days are coming and where you're going to be uh, with that. So obviously the men's is first and third Wednesday, and the women's Bible study is uh, what is it, every second and fourth Wednesday of the month. Uh, we have do have a congregational meeting coming on the 25th, which is yeah the last Sunday of February. Um, so that's we'll stay after after the service is over. We'll stay and we'll have a, a congregational meeting. So be prepared for that. Uh, there are two elders that are up for re-election. So that'll be my, myself and Walt. Um, so just think about that. Uh, we'll take a page from the presidential election, and nobody's going to debate. No, yeah, you can vote for both of us if you want. I mean, if you want to pick, I, I mean, I'd, I'd pick Walt. To be honest. <laughs> All right, uh, you heard Pastor Chris talk a couple times about a new members class that's coming up, so um, I don't think he doesn't have anything of exact. Oh, it looks like, no, it's March 2nd and 3rd, I'm sorry. So he does have dates uh, planned out, so the March 2nd is Saturday and then March 3rd. So there should be a sign-up in the back, um, so if you definitely want to do it and kind of know more about the church and what it means to be a member, you can sign up. Uh, also, you can speak to Chris once you see him. Um, the last announcement will be about the men's chili cook-off, so we'll talk about that. The, the, the great competition of the year is upon us. We need folks to sign up to compete and to the most material to eat. So please consider that sign up in the back. Whether you're cooking or you're coming, so you can have uh, a chance for how much food you eat. Uh, look forward to seeing you Friday night, 7 p.m. Thank you. Right, and that's all of our announcements. You guys are dismissed.